All right, let's uh, talk about design for uh, design for let's talk about design for tables. And in this, a table is going to be a little square box. Usually, it's going to have a title up here. And we're going to call this one users. And we'll say for every user that we have, we have multiple records in another table called auth tokens. And I'm just going to call that a token. Token like that. Now, the reason for having multiple token tables for users is you have one user, but they can log in on two different computers or log in twice, each one requiring an authentication token. So you've got multiple tokens for a single user. Also, the authentication tokens don't last forever. So the authentication token table has to have something like a creation date in it that when it's, say, 14 days old, we delete that row and they can't use that authentication token anymore. They've got to log back in on that device if they want to be able to use it. Or we do something, some other things having to do with guaranteeing that the tokens cycle over time. We have these tables, and we know how to create a table. The relationships between the tables are these lines with these little crow's feet arrows. In our SQL language, the square boxes end up being a create table. The line and the arrow ends up being the combination of some indexes and a foreign key relationship. Now, you can declare inside the table sometimes foreign key relationships, but generally speaking, you have to create both tables and then say that there's a foreign key from the table that has the multiple row side to the table that already exists the single row, because you have to have both tables in existence. So that line in between with the crow's feet actually gets declared in our code, in our SQL code, when we create the table. Now that's not the only kind of symbol. Sometimes you see them do like this little thing with a little circle and it connects over here to another little circle and they put one and n over here. There are some other different notations that people use. Or they do one little cross line through on this side and two little cross lines through on that side. Personally, I prefer the crow's feet. So that's the ones that we're going to use. Now, with these crow's feet things, okay, we are going to talk about there's a one to n relationship, one row of data on this side to n rows of data on this side, symbolized by the multiple rows. Now, in reality, that n can be anything between 0 up to n. So this second table is optional. Now, sometimes we want a one to one relationship. We want a table, okay, that has a relationship like one to one. Sometimes we want a table that has a relationship that's one to many, but there's some special properties over here, like this is ordered, like 0 through n. Okay, and we're going to look at things like that. And sometimes what we want is we want two tables, but they're going to relate to each other through a many to many relationship. And the way that that's actually modeled is you have the table on this side, A, you have a table in between. Okay, so it's going to do a one-to-many and a many-to-one relationship to some other table. So this gives you an M to N relationship between two tables. And all that's in this table here is two IDs that map up to each side. So we can look at the actual data, but this is kind of the relationships in an entity relationship diagram. And most databases are designed with them. We're going to be using a tool, and I'm going to go through it. It only has this one kind of relationship. It's just a drawing tool, so it's not real fancy. You notice I haven't listed out all of the columns and the data types by hand in here. But these are the kind of relationships you have in an ERD. And ERDs come in lots of different sizes. I've worked on things that have, say, 10,000 tables in the ERD. Uh, is not uncommon in industry. And each one of these different tables has a set of data that's supposedly a thing called normalized. Normalized data means that its unique properties are just for that data. It doesn't span different tables. Now, the reality of database design is designers think that normalization is the golden sprinkle that you put on everything to get everything to work well. That way, if you're going to update something, you're only updating one table. 
In reality, heavily normalized schemas tend to be difficult to update because you've got to go update rows in a whole bunch of different tables to get anything done. And some degree of denormalization quite often is really useful for performance because it allows indexes to index to certain kinds of things well. Remember, in some databases, nulls are not indexed. In Postgres, they're indexed, but they're not necessarily indexed efficiently, which means sometimes you want to use partial indexes so that you only index the actual data values in a column, not all the rows because most of them are null. So this whole process of normalizing everything is something that lots of people spend a lot of time on. And then you, as a person that's actually using and building something with this, you may come back and say, well, I really need this query to work faster. And because it's hitting this one special case here, what I really need to do is I need to stick an extra row in there that has a dummy value like zero so that everything is going to be tied together on an index. Now, also some applications, and I'm thinking of Python to Django, think that every time you create an original table and you have a one-to-many relationship, this foreign key relationship over here, you have an index on this side that you need, but it puts an index on the other side. And if you insert these in the order of the users and then the tokens, which was generally speaking the way that you're going to build things, okay, having an index on the other side does you no good. It just takes up space. So there are some strange ideas out there about indexes and normalization. If you look at stuff and say, a user's table should only have user data in it. It shouldn't have, like, um, account usage data in it, because that should be in an account table. And you say, what data is closely associated with users? And that's what you put in the user table. Then you do pretty good at figuring out what is normalized and what isn't. And I would never say normalize for the sake of normalizing. Okay, that is like a crazy person's idea of how to make everything work. What you see is that very often what you really need when you query stuff is you don't just need one table returned, you need that table and some other data from some other tables, which is why when you build out your API, quite often you're going to want to build in selects that make it easy to render information on the front end, which is not table by table, row by row, but what are they going to view? How are they going to view it? Am I sending all the data to them in one request? Because the slow piece is not the browser. The slow piece is not the database or the server. The slow piece is the connection in between. And if I can minimize the number of times that a request is made, then suddenly I get good performance. I was working on a project over in Europe. And I wasn't in Europe. I was here. But I was working on this project attempting to fix their performance for a commercial application that on its main page that every user used, they had gone and normalized their database. And they, when it painted that page, there was over 140 uh, selects that it took to paint the page because it had to select the data. And then it got a list of IDs. And then for every ID, it went out and selected each one of the rows for that. And then it selected some other thing, one row at a time. And this is the object model that they had built. And I looked at this and I went, well, the problem with your object model is what you really need is a stored procedure in the database that selects all this data in the database all at once, packages it all up, and pushes it out for this request. And I reduced their 140 to actually two selects. One had to do with security. If it passed that, then it did the data. And it did a stored procedure in the database, and it ran about 60 to 70 times as fast. Not quite 100 times as fast, but 60 to 70 times as fast as their original thing. And it made their product work. And their database people were completely horrified because, yes, I selected all this stuff and returned it all at once. And how are you going to update it? Well, if you're putting it all together in your application server and you're selecting it anyhow, how are you going to update it anyhow? You're going to have to, like break it down and build a whole bunch of different updates depending on what you want to update, which is what they'd already done. But yes, I just packaged it up all at once. And a whole bunch of those things, instead of selecting one at a time, I selected something with a join in it that hit key tables in sets all at once so that it would pick out whole bunches of data. And then it would add some other things in that it had already selected just once and just fill in some data. 
and give you a good fast result. So normalized is, okay, there's some good things about it. You're going to have to do it. And there are some bad things about it. Okay, so use it with care and realize why you would want it and why you would want to go, no, I really don't want it to come back that way. There is, and I'm hoping to get to this during this semester, a thing called GraphQL. And GraphQL is a non-SQL query language that basically takes your data and packs it up so you can select data and its dependencies all at once and get that back all at once. And there's, like a lot of things, some good things and some bad things about it. But for selecting certain kinds of data where you want to package stuff up and you want to go not just one table at a time and one row at a time, but one set of data across multiple ta tables, this can be a really good thing. So hopefully that explains what you see in ERDs. If you get some of those other notations, figure out which one is which. And um, I don't know, when I sit down and I build a table, I do a create table statement, what I'm thinking in my head is the design in the ERD. And sometimes, you know, I have posted up on my wall right beside me, there is a design that I've laid out as an ERD, and then now I'm coding it. And some tools have the ability to go straight from the ERD to the SQL with varying degrees of quality. For our class, your design work, we're going to use this drawing tool. If you pay them money, it can generate this equal, but you're only talking about, I think, six tables. So it's not going to stretch your brain to actually do the design. And when you get done with the design, just hand code the tables from the design. But I will want to see the design itself.